So where do you start your troubleshooting? Oftentimes, one of the issues that we come into is people are having trouble accessing the internet. This is the actual phrase you're going to hear a million times over. The internet is down. Yes, that's right. The entire internet itself has gone down. No, that's not really the case. But sometimes we have to figure out specifically what part of the internet is down. And is it down for the entire organization or just one side or whatever? This is a particularly big problem because now with the advent of the cloud and cloud-based technologies and software as a service, like Office 365, when the internet goes down, our productivity goes down quite a bit. So this could be a high, high risk issue that we need to resolve right away. It could be uh, not even our issue in the first place. So in this video, that's what we're going to talk about. How do we figure this stuff out? Let's go. So it's just something that happens. It's unfortunate, but it is absolutely something that happens in every single business, whether small or big. Somebody stands behind you over your shoulder and says the internet is down. Don't worry about the fact that we have a ticketing system or a protocol or a process for reporting issues or the fact that we have instant messenger or phones. No, they're going to stand behind you and tell you that the internet is down. It's just something that happens. It's part of it's part of the job. It's why you get paid the big bucks, right? It's And it's just what we have to do. We have to figure out what does it really mean that the internet is down we have to probe all of these additional questions before we just dig into it immediately because oftentimes what's actually happening is just one website is down or uh, just one particular computer is down because of a faulty cable or uh, one particular group of people are down because of a misconfigured switch or something like that and it's on us to take these steps to go just one little step further. But the big thing is, and we have to keep in mind is, where is the internet? What is the internet? When you say the internet is down, let's start with that. Let's actually take that into consideration that the internet may be down because that could actually be an issue or really what we're trying to say is our connection to the internet is down. Now, okay, first of all, let's draw it up. So here's our building, here we are. Uh, and our service provider comes in, they bring in a fiber line, and they've got like a little modem here, and it's going to connect into our router or firewall. Actually, you know what, I'm just going to put just like a little uh, firewall here, because that's the most likely scenario. And then it goes out, it breaks out into the rest of the building, right, where we've got, you know, switches... And then from the switches, go out to the computers and the phones and everything. So when we say, when we talk about the internet, what are we really talking? We're talking about everything that's not our internal business. It's everything that's outside of the building. The internet is an interconnection of networks. It's an internetwork. It's literally what it's broken down on. And oftentimes what we're really thinking about is the fact that we have a service provider, maybe something like AT&T or maybe something like Cox Communications or Level 3 or CenturyLink or whatever the case is. And what they really are at the end of the day is they're just another absolutely gigantic version of a network. Just like what we have internal in our office, in our building, we have all these computers who are networked together. Well, guess what? That's what a service provider has too. Their network just spans across a larger region. It's something that may span across the state. It's something that may span across the country, or it's something that may actually span across uh, the entire world, especially now that we see things like Starlink coming to life, where they're literally beaming down internet around the entire world is kind of fascinating. And the fact that the thing that makes it an internet work is the fact that we'll have a pink service provider here, and then we'll have a different service provider here, and they share networks and routes to each other. So when we have a computer, someone sitting at their computer right here, and they're trying to reach a server, maybe a website or a file share server that lives over here, that's outside of our building and it leaves outside of our control. So what's really happening here is this computer is going to reach out through the network. It may do something like NAT as it goes outbound. And then it goes through our service provider and then it traverses through a different service provider all the way till it makes its way to the server. Now, when we actually look at this in the real world, what, what is the actual internet? We look at this with these two service providers in this, in this example right here. What actually happens here is all the service providers in the world share all of the networks that they know about to each other. That's every single public network in the world is shared to every single service provider that's providing a service. As of the time of this recording, this is the honest truth, as of the time of this recording, there are over 800,000 routes 
in a service provider's routing table. When a service provider looks up, okay, where's the next destination? How do I get to that next place that I'm trying to get to? It has 800,000 routes and prefixes that it has to parse through to pick the best one. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's absolutely uh, hard to wrap your head around the fact that we can get to a server around the world in millisecond time where each one of these routers along the way have to make a forwarding decision in you know sub millisecond time when they have 800 thousand prefixes that they have to parse. It, I mean, these are the types of things that it makes you realize how cool the technology that you work with really is, because this is our world. This is what we deal with. And when somebody tells us the entire internet is down, you're kind of like, well, is it really down? The honest truth is, is it actually could be that we live in a world where there are hackers, people who perform DDoS. A DDoS attack means there is just a tremendous number of computers that have been compromised by ma malware or a virus or something like that. And somebody takes over all tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of these computers and they just start flooding one specific endpoint, sometimes it is a service provider, with just a tremendous amount of traffic such that uh, that entire service provider loses its ability to forward traffic out. Lots of times they actually target something like a uh, very big, very high profile DNS server. And that DNS server may support things like Amazon Cloud Service or Microsoft Azure Cloud Service. So when that DNS server goes down, service providers' ability to perform resolution goes down, but also cloud providers go down. This happens, you know, once or twice a year, not very frequently, but at that time it could. Somebody comes to you and says the internet is down and you know, you're know you so used to the, the boy who cried wolf that you shrug it off. And in this case, the internet is actually down and there's nothing you could do about it. But you need to be able to troubleshoot these types of things. You need to be able to pinpoint, is the internet actually down? And importantly, what part of the internet is down? Is, is the entire internet down because of a DDoS attack against a service provider? or um, an Amazon cloud server? Is the entire internet down uh, because a service provider implemented a bad BGP route prefix? I'm, I don't expect you to really know what that is. Um, and th this is something that the server plus exam won't expect you to know what BGP is or anything like that. But this is something that happens again, relatively frequently. And when I say, I mean relatively frequently, I mean like once or twice a year, but still it happened. Yeah, I remember when it happened just a few months ago, it was a massive outage. Like the entire East Coast of the United States, including the cloud providers all went down because one service provider in upstate New York implemented BGP incorrectly. And that caused a flood of firewall rules. BGP can carry firewall rules. It's called flows. It caused a flood of firewall rules to be sent throughout the internet that shut down all of these ports and all of these IP addresses. It was it was wild. But anyways, uh, that was, that's stuff that can actually happen. So when somebody reports to you the internet is down, again, if I only had a, like a nickel for every time I heard that, uh, I'd have a lot of nickels. But maybe 5% of those were actually accurate. And you do have to take these types of complaints very serious. So what we're talking about here is external network troubleshoot. What we're really saying here is the network that we don't really have a lot of dominion over. We don't really have a lot of control over it because it's the service provider's network or it's something with global DNS. So how do we figure out if something is really going on uh, with the external network and with any type of troubleshooting that goes out towards the internet. Well, the easiest way to do it is with good old fashioned command line. If I bring up my command prompt, we'll zoom in a good amount so that way you can actually see what the font says. You know, one of the easiest ways to absolutely test whether the internet is up is to ping Google's DNS server. This is like literally what everybody does because it's just so easy to remember. If we ping 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, this is Google's DNS server. I press enter and I see uh, that I have round trip traffic. What this immediately signals to me is that my computer that I live on right here in my home office uh, was able to go out to the internet, navigate through the entire internet and make its way to Google's DNS server, which is at 8.8.8.8, .8 .8, a publicly routable IP address owned by Google. And it can reply directly back to my computer with no issue whatsoever. This immediately tells me that my ability for my computer to reach out to a resource on the public internet is not inhibited. Layers one, two, and three 
are all working exactly as we expect. Now notice here, I didn't mention layer four and I didn't mention any application layers. What we're talking about here, when we actually do a ping request, this is a protocol called ICM. So this is good news, but something that may also come up is a question about whether or not uh, your packet is actually dying along the way. This is another very important tool that you should know about whenever you're troubleshooting uh, an external network resource. In fact, this is just a very important tool that you should absolutely know about, and that's called Trace. Traceroute actually does what its name implies. It traces every single router, every single IP address that it passes through along the way. How does it actually do that? It's kind of a fascinating thing. Basically what it does is it sends basically three ping requests or echo requests is what they're called, but it sets the time to live uh, to be a very maximum number to where instead of allowing it the, the typical number of hops left, it's gonna set the number to where the next hop that it goes through, it dies and gets a reply. So in a nutshell, the way this really works is when I try and do something like a trace route out to 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, what it's really doing under the hood is it's going one hop at a time. For instance, maybe it goes to my default gateway, but it's actually sending a ping that it dies the moment it gets there because the time to live means that how many hops am I allowed to go further before I say this has been too many hops, this packet is dead, somebody needs to reply and say this packet is dead. So when it sends this ping to my default gateway saying that the packet has expired, the default gateway replies with a packet is dead. Well, that's interesting. So the trace route now knows where the first hop is. Then it sends it one hop further to the next router, but that next router also has a time to live that's expired. So it replies that the trace route that we're going down is dead. Then it repeats the process one more time. Do you see what I'm talking? Do you see where I'm going with this? It just goes one hop at a time, trying to figure out where everything has died until it eventually makes its way to its actual destination. And we know uh, where, where, where how, what were all the routers that we went through to get to this point. On a Windows machine, I'm gonna try type trace RT 8.8.8.8. .8 now on a Linux based machine, you actually type the whole thing out, trace route as one word, trace R-O-U-T-E. Then 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 on a Linux machine or a Mac OS machine, and then it'll do the exact same uh, response here. So when I press enter, it's gonna take a little bit because it tries to do some DNS resolution, but it's gonna find its way out of my network into the public internet, and it's gonna find one hop at a time what, what is the path that I went through in order to get 8.8.8.8? .8 .8 so you see what it's doing right now? It's going one step at a time, trying to find the router, figuring out which one it's dying at, and then it makes its way back. It's so fascinating. I absolutely love watching this just to see uh, how we can actually see it. what is my computer navigating through to get out to the real world. Again, this is a fascinating check because uh, this will absolutely tell us, you know, whether or not uh, the, the packet is made outside of our network and is dying somewhere along the way. This is kind of an interesting thing that we can now see. So after a while, we're going to be able to see it makes its way to 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. Uh, we're still doing all of this in sub millisecond time, which I think. And there we go. The trace has completed and it is resolved to Google DNS. It took 13 hops uh, to make its way from my home office all the way out to the public internet and all the way through the internet to get to Google's DNS server, wherever that's located in the world. 13 hops is what it took to get across the country effectively. Again, keep in mind how just fantastic the internet uh, is in general. When I can ping 8.8.8.8, .8 .8 .8, it goes through those 13 hops there and then 13 hops back and it does the whole thing in 15 milliseconds. That is just phenomenal that we could do things like that. And then also keep in mind that everybody in the world who's doing ping requests right now is probably doing it against 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8. So this poor server is just getting clobbered by ICMP requests. But nonetheless, this is just what we do. So this is a very quick way that we could figure out uh, if, you know, layer three uh, or up to layer three traffic is actually working the way we expect it to. But the, the, the old adage is it's always DNS, right? It's always DNS. And sometimes the issue that we're having is that we can't actually resolve DNS-based traffic. Now, the way it's more than likely going to work in your environment, you're going to have your computer. And your computer is going to have something like a router or a firewall or a server that acts as the default gateway. It also may use something like a 
DNS server in your environment. Sometimes your default gateway is also your DNS server, but in most enterprises, the DNS server is something you know truly unique. Uh, it's, it's its own server and you can do name resolution that way. So then what happens is, let's say I wanna look up a, a domain name in my entire environment, and I ask my DNS server, well, what's the IP address for this domain name? Well, what happens if the DNS server doesn't know? What, what does it do? Well, it just asks the next DNS server in the line. This may be something like uh, a service provider's DNS server, or it may be Google's DNS server, the 8.8.8.8 uh, that we just used. So this is another interesting tidbit, is we may be able to get to our DNS server and perform a domain name lookup, no problem, but the forwarding, if the DNS server doesn't have an, uh, the actual entry already in its cache or stored manually in its database, then it has to ask upstream towards an internet-based DNS server, and this connection could be down. This DNS server could be down, again, because of things like DDoS or, you know, the, uh, the ISP was outside, you know, doing some trench work and cut some fiber and severed your connection out to the world and out to your DNS server. So how can you actually test if external DNS resolution is working? For instance, what if I wanted to do a DNS lookup against the 8.8.8.8 server? We can actually use NS Lookup, a tool on our command line to do just that. A lot of people go through this where they type NS Lookup and then say immediately something like google.com and it gives you the response. The fascinating thing about this is this is going to use your own default DNS server that you have configured on your NIC at this time. If you want to override that and set your own DNS server, one of the handiest things that nobody ever talks about is the fact that you can just type NS lookup without anything else and press enter, and it actually takes you into this like command prompt where you can add additional uh, parameters into this actual setting. So one of the things that you can actually do is type server in right here, and then say I specifically want to use 8.8.8.8. .8 .8 .8 .8 and I'll press enter, and now we see the command prompt has changed to use the 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 server. Now I can type google.com and press enter, and this is what's pretty interesting. It used the 8.8.8.8 .8 .8 server right here. See the google.com entry that I typed in and specifies what server did we use to look this up as, and then it gave the answers right here. So this now validates that DNS for my external network is also working right now. So things like ping, traceroute, even NS lookup seem simple on the face level, but they can actually be very powerful when you start to consider how the internet works and whether or not the internet is actually up or down. So this has been how to do some basic troubleshooting when somebody tells you the internet is down. Might, may or may not be down. And here's some quick tidbits on how you can figure that. I hope this has been informative for you and I'd like to thank you for viewing.